Hi, I'm Amanda from Realise Beauty and today I'm going to try and answer a question about why your melt and pour soaps sweat. So let's get on with it. Uh, this is actually really interesting because it's kind of like a mixture between the weather and, um, and the formula. So let's have a little look at that. So a typical melt and pour soap contains a number of ingredients. So you have water um, and then you have a mixture of humectants, usually a blend of glycerin, sorbitol and propylene glycol. You also have the soap. So none of that stuff is soap. That's not the soapy stuff. The soapy stuff is usually either sodium or potassium stearate, um, sodium potassium laurate or something like that so it's the fats um, but by far the biggest um, things in the formula are usually your humectants so humectants are water binders they will bind moisture to them and that's part of what's going on in your melt and pour soap humectants like to share water evenly between themselves and the environment so when the environment is very wet relatively high humidity the soap or product might sweat because there's more water outside than inside the formula so it's really the difference between the humidity on the outside and the humidity on the inside there's lots of different humectants as i've mentioned just quickly and um, glycerin is the most common and then you've got sorbitol propylene glycol you've also got honey now each of those chemicals have different um, chemical formulas and different molecular weights so glycerin has a molecular weight of about 92 grams per mole versus sorbitol um, which has a molecular weight of 182 ish grams per mole now this is relevant because the bigger the molecule the less water um, per gram it can hold which kind of seems a bit odd but if you think about it the lighter the molecule is the more you can get into a gram so the more hands it's got to kind of grab onto the water now glycerin was 92 sorbitol was 182 propylene glycol is 76 so propylene glycol is better than glycerin and propylene and sorbitol at binding water Honey has a molecular weight um, of it's quite varied, obviously, because honey is different things. But honey is made up of sugars, fructose and glucose. And those sugars each have a molecular weight of around 180. So in the grand scheme of things, you've got propylene glycol being the best at binding water. Then you've got glycerin. Then you've got so um, sorry, the honey bits and pieces. And then you've got sorbitol. So. Um, if you're a formulator of melt and pour soap, you can create a more humidity resistant formula by playing around with all those different humectants and using different ones so that you, um, you get a good humidity resistance without affecting the formula's look, feel, price point and perform, general performance and obviously irritability. Um, propylene glycol can be a little bit irritating in high levels. So the formulator is trying to juggle that. In terms of the... Um, the um, the ingredients you'll also see that um, humectants um, are affected by um, their concentration so um, ironically if you uh, if you plot a graph of percentages of glycerin against its relative humidity um, the lower the level of glycerin in the formula the higher the formula's relative um, humidity is because it's more saturated I suppose so if you pack a lot of glycerin into formula 80 90 percent your formula's relative humidity is actually going to be quite low it's going to be relatively dry because the moisture is all bound up in the glycerin so oddly enough we want to balance out the um, the relative humidity of the formula um, by not putting too much humectant in which all sounds rather weird but um, graphs were done oh years and years ago in the 1800s early 1900 um, early 19 somethings um, a 10 percent of um, glycerin solution gave a relative humidity of about 98 percent whereas a 50 percent glycerin solution have a relative humidity of about 84 percent um, most of the time the air's humidity is between 40 and 80 percent so we kind of as formulators we need to bear that in mind not overcook it not put too much humectant in but just enough so that the humidity of our formula is matching the maximum that we'd expect in the um, or around the rate we'd expect in the environment so that's pretty much what we're doing in terms of if you're just buying a melt and pour base what can you do to help yourself well don't overheat it when you're mixing it now um, you obviously need to heat it to melt it um, and then you do your coloring and whatnot and then you pour it and, and um, bind it again but if you overheat it you're going to evaporate some water if you evaporate some water you're going to concentrate the humectant that's already there and you don't want to do that because then more humectant lower relative humidity of your base more potential for frosting so don't do that so when you're melting and pouring 
try and keep it at a low temperature if you can. In terms of the weather, um, the weather's a funny one because the hotter the air gets, the more water it can hold. But it's not important to the soap how hot it is. All that's important is relative humidity, that percentage relative humidity. So someone in a cold place, someone in a hot place, um, can have the same relative humidity, but the hot place is gonna have more water in the air um, versus the cold place. So this sort of soap issue, which you can sort of half see on here, yeah, you can see those little bits there, that little bit of moisture, that's gonna be a problem in any climate as long as the relative humidity goes quite high. So um, just look out for that. Um, the humidity doesn't damage the soap, it's coming from outside, not inside, but what it can do is obviously not look good, it can make the soap slimy and um, less attractive. Um, the only difference a high temperature humidity will give is make the soap possibly more um, prone to mould because there's more water around, so the higher water activity. Um, what can I say? Well, that's basically it. So your, your melt and pour soap thing is a fairly easy project. It's hard to formulate, hard to get right. But um, once you sort of juggle around with your humectancy and your little bits of um, your ratios of bits and pieces, you can create a formula that can tolerate quite a lot of conditions. Um, but it's a bit of science involved. And obviously the weather is unpredictable and you're never going to get something that can cover all the solutions you can only cover the most of it so happy formulating hope that helps and see you again for some more questions possibly thank you